But this was this was later. This was the dawn of the 21st century uh, that we're, that we've now gotten up to, and um, in uh, what happened right at that time, at the dawn of the 21st century, was a British author named J.K. Rowling started writing a series of books about a, a young wizard's apprentice going to a school for witchcraft, and wizardry, and magic, and sorcery. And this became the largest literary phenomenon of all time. It was huge. Millions upon millions of people really got into this. When the first movie came out, uh, several years after the books, Morning Glory and I were asked by a Jewish shul if we would come and give a talk to their whole school, and then afterwards we would all go out and see the Harry first Harry Potter movie. It was a premiere. <coughs> we said, that sounds like fun. Somehow, they were looking, they, they thought it would be cool to have a witch and a wizard, a real one, <coughs> to talk to them, and somehow they found us, and there we were. <laughs> so we showed up in full regalia, you know, pointy hats, and, and brooms, and staffs, and did demonstrations, and talked to people, and did a few little little tricky things, you know, just to make it interesting. You know, we got to do that. You know, little special effects. And um, I had a great time. And uh, everybody loved it. And afterwards, we went off to the movie. Well, we didn't have time to change in a normal street clothes. It didn't really matter because when we got there, man, there were pointy hats. And <laughs> <laughs> of course, they were a little shorter, most of them. But it was, co it was very cool. You know? And so there we were. And that place was packed. And they had reserved the entire balcony for the school, and this crowd, and we got, you know, because we were guests of honor, we got front row, center, in the balcony, and looking down over the sea of pointy hats and eager faces and watching the movie and really digging it. It was really good. It was a lot of fun. And we got to thinking, say, wow, you know, a lot of these people are going to see this, and they're going to want to go looking for the real thing. We say, this is this wizardry, this magic stuff, this is really cool. There must be some you know, what's really out there? What's what's really available? Well, for a number of years I've been lamenting in my workshops and presentations that in the pagan community, especially in the Wiccan community, we didn't really have a way to assimilate our kids, young people. I mean, the whole thing was it's adults only. you got to be 18 before you can even apply to start studying or joining a covenant or something. Um, all of the um, all of the online services were available. You had to be 18, you know, and all this stuff. There really wasn't anything for kids. And I think, well, you know, these kids are going to have to have somewhere to go. There's going to be millions of them. What can we do for that? So we thought, well, what we do is we make altar figurines, such as that one there in this book here. So we said, why don't we make, uh, the, I mean, the first thing you do when you set your foot on the path of magic is you create an altar. That's, that's, the, that's it. That's the thing that sets it up. So we said, look, we don't have any altar figurines for kids. So let's make a kid's god and goddess figurines. And, we did that. They're, they're here. It's been a few months doing that. Now, this happened, um, oh, I don't know, sometime in the winter, February or something, when we saw the movie and stuff. Here, you can pass these around. I'm looking at a few. There's catalogs of some of our stuff. You can check out because I'll be talking about some of that stuff. Um, so, over the next few months, you know, I worked on getting these figures done, and that summer, we decided to go to the International New Age Trade Show in Denver, Colorado, where all different kinds of people who make cool stuff come and show them off, and, and the stores send their representatives to decide what they're going to stock in their stores, and that was kind of the deal. So we thought, all right, well, we got this new, these new things that are really neat, so we should go and show them off, this new kids' god and goddess for the Harry Potter generation stuff. So we went there with them and had a good time. And in the middle of this, um, uh, Trish Telesco, who is a pagan author who's written well over 60 books, and she herself has no idea how many. She's lost count. Um, many of them are out of print, but all of them are brilliant. And I highly recommend absolutely anything by Trish. She's really good. A lot of them have to do with folklore or, or customs or you know odd things like Victorian flower languages or superstitions, but all of them are, are really brilliant. And, um, Quite a few of them have to do with magic and witchcraft and so So she comes up to me, and she, cause she's there because her publisher um, had brought her along to sign her latest book that they were releasing. So she was there doing book signing, much as I am here. And um, so she came by our booth, and was looking at her stuff, and I congratulated her because we knew each other. I basically, in the process, because we had published a magazine and traveled all the stuff, Morning Glory and I, we knew pretty much all of the people who were the leaders and the founders and the authors 
of the movement over the years and the decades, you know, and most all of us kind of know each other. You know the six degrees of separation thing? Well, in the pagan community, it's like one. <laughs> <laughs> and in most cases, it's not even that. It's, you know, all over the place, you know, everywhere we go, we know lots, especially the people who have been around a while. So, uh, so Trish says, well, Oberon, um, when are you going to write your book? I said, oh, I don't know, Trish, I've been so busy, I've written lots of editorials, I've edited a magazine, I've got lots of stuff, but I just, you know, I never quite got around to put together for a book or anything, and she says, come with me, I want you to meet my publisher. So she takes me over to the new page booth, and introduces me in glowing terms to the acquisitions editor, Lori, and um, says, you've got to sign this guy, you've got to get this guy to write for you. Thinking, oh well, um, and so Lori says, "Well, sit down and have, me have a seat and tell me if you were going to write a book for us, what would you write about?" Now, up to that moment, I had not given this a moment's thought. It simply had not entered my mind. But I said, "I said, well, you know, um, because I'm still thinking along the terms that brought me to making these little figures and the whole Harry Potter phenomenon and where it can go and where people can go with it." I said, "Well, I could, I'd like to write a book of apprentice wizardry, sort of like a." Boy Scout Handbook for Young Wizards. Who are, what you need to know when you start off. What I wish I had had available when I was like 11. I wish somebody would have given me this book. I want to write that book. And, and I really got into that. She said, that sounds great. You know, send us a proposal. So I said, okay, okay. Well, that was one. Um, about a month after that, I was at the Starwood Pagan Festival, which is this huge gathering in upstate New York. Some of you may be familiar with it's like. You have up to 1,500 people there at times. Big thing. And I've, I've been going there for many years. I've, they always invite me back. I'm sort of a guest speaker and stuff. They find me entertaining. And as long as they do that and want to bring me back, I'll keep going because it's a lot of fun. It's a really great party. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And um, so I'm going there, and I've, and I've got our statues and figurines. And the, um, the woman who modeled for my Aphrodite statue, whose name is Giorgio, was there. And... Um, uh, she was actually getting married that year, so uh, she says to me, hey, I hear you're going to be writing for a new page. I'm working for a new page as a publicist, so if you write for them, I'll be, we'll be working together because I'll be helping to publicize you. Cool. <laughs> you know, that would be, that's two. So I go back uh, home, and a few days later there's a knock on the door, and I go to the door, and there's this enormous bouquet of flowers filling the doorway with feet sticking out underneath it, and a card stuck on the top. It says, from your friends at New Page, don't forget, you're going to write a book for us. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> nice reminder. We managed to squeeze the bouquet of flowers through the door and find something big enough to put them in in the middle of the table. And, uh, so, well, that was three, and, you know, I guess I was committed at that point. So I figured, okay, i got to write this book. So I, I wrote the proposal, and as I was writing, I was thinking, you know, I know a lot of stuff, because I've been around a while, but one of the most important things I know is how many people there are who know more than I do out there. The people who've been writing stuff for Green Egg, the people who started their own groups, the people who've written other books. You know, the, our community is full of, of wizards, of, of sages and mages and, and wise ones and all that stuff. And really, this is something that should not just be a one-person job. This is, should be something in which you know, the collective wisdom of our community can be compiled into one place and offered to the next generation. And um, so I started talking to, the, to these folks I know, uh, an illustrious bunch of people I'm very proud to know. And, and we decided to, to form the legendary Wizards Council that, that permeates the stories and the histories. It's always been Wizards Councils. And uh, so we formed the Grey Council out of this. And the purpose was to... Um, I would write the stuff, I would write what I thought and organize it, design it, and all this stuff, but send it around Robin, and people would add their two cents or other things or pieces they thought were right or correct me if I said something stupid, whatever it took to make it work. And out of this, over a period of, of a considerable time, a remarkable book emerged. Uh, in our, our family tradition, our matron goddess is Bridget goddess of inspiration, of poetry, of smithcraft, obviously, all arts and crafts, and good stuff. Bridget's a great goddess. She's really wonderful. And uh, so we have a, we always maintain an altar to Bridget in the middle of our home. And um, her 
her feast day, Brigantia, or, or Bridget's Day, or Emelk, or Imbolc, or Candlemas, it's got more names than any other festival, is at the beginning of February, 1st or 2nd of February, Groundhog's Day. <coughs> and um, so our tradition is to hold a bardic, which, which means everybody comes and, and, and presents something of their creativity. Uh, most commonly, it'll be songs, poetry, writings, sometimes arts and crafts, but it's a creative offering to Bridget to be presented in thanks for her inspiration over the year. And at that, I, I introduced the, for the first part, I, I just done the very first beginning thing for the book, because it just started there, the uh, uh, wizard's, a wizardly soliloquy, which is there, in which Basically, it's, it's sort of a fictional narrative thing, you know, you're sitting around the campfire and out of the shadows, you know, the, the old man with the long beard and the pointy hat comes up and waves his hand over the fire and sparkly things happen and it gives you this little rap, you know. Well, you can read it, it's in the book. But it's, but it's one that I had actually done around many a campfire. It's, um, I enjoy sitting around campfires. I go to gatherings and I spend the evenings going from campfire to campfire and sitting in and sharing stories and tales and songs and chants and, you know, and whatever else people have to share. And it's a lovely thing. So that, that was what they introduced to Bridget of that. And then and throughout the rest of the year we continued working on the book and putting it together and people were putting in these ideas and I was drawing artwork for it and other people were contributing and it developed and it unfolded and, and it became organized and, and the whole concept itself, the project kind of took over and, and sorted itself out. So the thing ended up being de designed as a series of classes and lessons and teachings. Because we, we meant it to be teachings, but but not pedantic type stuff. It had to be fun and interesting, but it had to be the stuff that, you know, next next new creation when I come around, when I'm 11, I want, I want you know, somebody to give me this book for my, you know, coming of age, you know. Yeah. That was where we were all thinking. You know, this had to be that. Uh, the following year, on Bridget, that very day, the mail arrived with the first box of books. And we put one on the altar. One day to the moment. One year to the moment. And, and that's how it began. Well, somewhere about halfway through the book, I, I said, I, I was thinking, well, you know, I don't want this to be the end of it for people. I mean, this is an introduction only. I can only really introduce these various fascinating topics. So. I should be able to send the readers on to where they can learn more. And I'm thinking, well, I've heard there's a lot of online schools of magic, which school and many others that were teaching magical subjects. And I thought, well, I'll just find one that's suitable. I had to find one for one thing. Um, it didn't. It had to not be religious because I'm not, I'm not trying to turn people's kids into some onto some funny religion, even if it's my own. That's not the job here. Wizardry is not a religion. It's like philosophy or science. You know, you can be. I have philosophers, scientists, wizards of any religion, any tradition, and, and there have been many very famous ones of every culture has produced great wizards. And, and we needed to preserve that. I didn't want this to be identified as just a pagan thing, a church of all worlds thing, any specific religion at all. It had to be universal. So I wanted to look for a website that was teaching magic in a non-religious context, and one that um, uh, in which kids could sign in and learn stuff, you know. That would be one, obviously, because I'm trying to address this for readers as young as 11. Although if you read the book, you'll see, if you note carefully, that the reading level goes up chapter by chapter, about a year. I, I worked with an editor who had worked with children's books and, and could set the vocabulary and the style with reading level to progress over a seven-year period. So by the time you're reading the last chapter, you know, you're reading at, at, uh, at seven years of advance from the very first one. And, it was very, very tricky little stuff like that embedded in. So it had to be, so it needed a website that taught magic in a non-religious context, and kids were welcome. And so, you know how many of those I found? Big, <coughs> fat, zero. There was nothing, nobody out there was teaching, offering online magical teaching. I, I was blown away, I just couldn't believe it. But that was the case. There were quite a few teaching it in the context of of witchcraft, of their particular tradition of witchcraft, which is all very cool. But they were teaching their own trip. And, and nothing wrong with that, but that really wasn't the point of trying to send the readers to this book on to. You know? And nobody was letting kids in anyway. You had to be 18. So that was that. So, well, 
in, in my life there has been one principle that has recurred time and time again. And that's that periodically I get these mysterious astral phone calls. And the voice of the goddess says, your next assignment, should you choose to accept it. <laughs> you know, and, and I figured out very early on how this works, you know. You know, you, if you say no, then they cancel your show, and that's it. Because, you know, the gods aren't going to want to watch you just sitting there, sitting at home, you know, doing, doing crossword puzzles, you know. You, you, you've got to keep them entertained, or they're going to, you know, going to go look for somebody else to be more entertaining. So I, I know that if I get that call, i got to go, okay, <laughs> what do I need to do, what do I need to know? And I, I long ago gave up asking the obvious, why me? You know, because it's because the answer you like likely to get back is because you pissed me off, or because, or because you're fun to watch, and you know, uh, you want something a little more, a little more respectable than that. So I gave that up, and I just go, okay, uh, what is it I need to know? What is it I need to do? And I, I get that back. But really, what it is is if you see the thing that needs to be done then that means this is a job for you. you know, like the old, this is a job for Superman or whatever it is. So there I was. I had an assignment. I had to create an online um, study program that would be teach real magic and real the wisdom of the ages in a non-religious context and that kids could, could be welcome to it. Well, the obvious model this sitting right out there in front of you. You know, it was created by J.K. Rowling, and millions of people totally dug it. The idea of, uh, of a Hogwarts kind of a school model, and it, it just seems so obvious and so and so natural. We, uh, the the book had already created an organization of classes and lessons, so I took a lot of these and retooled them and, and created, uh, you know, study guides and um, uh, exams and assignments and. You know, all kinds of stuff. Um, 